Welcome to Viking Aircraft Engines. Today, we're gonna to answer some questions that have come up from customers through email or at air shows. Uh, just trying to get some information straight as far as what we do, why we do what we do, why our engine is different than other engines, why we feel like we have a better engine than our competition, and just answering FAQs that we've had so that you can get a better understanding for why we believe that this is the way for the future when it comes to light sport aircraft engines. So what exactly do we do at Viking Aircraft Engines? We specialize in using automotive engines of the latest year and we convert those engines so they can be used in light aircraft, two and four seat aircraft. Also single seaters now with the 90 horsepower. So why is it important to use uh, mass-produced engines like Viking does in small aircraft, uh, specifically aircraft that customers are building at home in their garages, at airports, in their airplane hangars, uh, because first of all it's experimental aviation and part of experimental aviation is to make it interesting and also affordable for more people to be able to fly. Now, making it affordable doesn't have to mean that you have to sacrifice on quality. Just like you're getting the right primer for your plane and making sure you corrosion prepare and use the proper wires and everything, you also want to use the proper engine. So what exactly is the right engine? Well, looking at the industry that we're in uh, as a company, we can clearly see that the number of airplane kits that are being sold each year is declining and that the amount of people that are flying and enjoying our hobby is decreasing. So it's important that the engine that you receive for your airplane is a mass-produced engine where you can get parts everywhere. There's no real telling how long uh, companies that are producing 100 engines or 200 engines a year are going to be around, number one. And also keep in mind that uh, the development that's going into engines right now are not going into air-cooled engines, they're not going into specific or, or special purpose engines, they're going into automotive engines because of the uh, environmental protection, the fuel efficiency, the lightness of the engines that are required now. So you're looking at an automotive conversion engine that are leaps and bounds ahead of anything that you could buy that was specifically made for an aircraft that either would be too expensive, too heavy, the company's not making enough of them to uh, sustain producing them and supporting them. Um, Viking uses the Honda engine and the Mitsubishi engine where parts are available at every auto parts store or obviously from Mitsubishi or Honda. Uh, it's difficult to get parts for other engines. You have to maybe mail order them. Uh, you have to request them uh, ahead of time. This is something that is uh, not convenient if you are, for instance, stranded at an airport on a Sunday and you need a starter. Um, so be very particular about what engine you buy that's going to serve you good as far as a practical standpoint. And you know that you get in your car every morning and you, you know, maybe take a boat out or a motorcycle and those engines are produced by the millions and you will be able to get parts and you know that they're reliable. Now, um, let's just start in uh, no particular order. I want to just uh, go down the list of the little notes we've made about what kind of uh, questions people might have, uh, advantages, disadvantages about these, this engine. So what I'd like to mention first is uh, about heat. Um, a lot of the country, when it goes towards fall, um, it gets cold. And, uh, not so much in Florida, maybe Texas, and. Well, even northern Texas and uh, also going to altitude, it can get cold. So one nice thing about an engine that you pick as far as a practical standpoint is are you going to freeze or are you going to be hot, you know, as far as sitting in that cockpit. Can you produce enough heat to be comfortable for two people to enjoy flying during the winter time? Now, first we're going to talk about the heat associated with an air-cooled engine and afterwards, we'll talk about heat that you can have from a liquid-cooled engine. So we're gonna start explaining the heat that you will be able to derive from an air-cooled engine. Now, 
being practical, we have to look at when do we really need this heat? Of course we want the heat as the hours go by and we're flying cross country in the winter. But more importantly, we might not even really want to go fly in the winter unless we have heat immediately when we get in the airplane. So let's talk about getting heat immediately from an air-cooled engine. Um, it takes time for the engine to heat up, for the cylinders to heat up, for the exhaust to heat up, to get any kind of measurable or real heat uh, out of the uh, exhaust system, which is where the heat is derived. The air-cooled engine traditionally use a muff around the exhaust system, which can, can consist of just a hollow chamber that air is pushed through and it touches the muffler and then it's pushed into the airplane. Or it can be a chamber filled with springs or something that will absorb that heat and catch a little bit more of that heat before the air is pushed into the engine, uh, out of the engine compartment and into the uh, cabin. So when we first start the engine up and it's cold out, minus whatever, and we wanna go flying, we have the propeller pushing air into the cowling uh, through the exhaust and then into the airplane. There's not a lot of force from the propeller at idle. Uh, there's not a lot of heat from the engine at idle because the heat is not, the engine is not producing a lot of power, so there's not a lot of heat being generated in the exhaust. So that being said, there's not a lot of pressure from the air and there's not a lot of real heat being pushed uh, through the exhaust system and into the airplane. Next, we're gonna talk about the exhaust heat and how many people it has killed throughout the years when it comes to general aviation. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, number of people that have died up through the years. Um, you don't hear too much about it because a lot of general aviation is actually based on air-cooled engines. Uh, it didn't used to be in the war, then it has been for many years, and now we're going back to liquid-cooled engines. But if you do an NTSB search, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of people that have died simply because nobody ever makes any changes in aviation. You'll see the exhaust systems that these heat muffs are wrapped around uh, have slip joints. They're extremely thin because we want light weight in an aircraft. And exhaust systems on opposed engines, which most or all um, air-cooled engines are right now, have to go from cylinder to cylinder to cylinder and then even across the engine. So you end up with long exhaust pipe with, ex with the slip expansion joints and then heat muffs around this. So you're asking for a failure sooner or later where exhaust is now going to get into the heat muff and then be pushed into the cabin and people have band-aid uh, fixes such as carbon monoxide detectors that you're supposed to look at when you're half dead and it goes on and on and on. So not only is it old fashioned, it is scary. It does in fact kill people. Uh, exhaust heat off the muff probably should never be used anymore. And that's our opinion. It's not because we're selling liquid cooled engines, but it is a major thing to consider if you're flying an air cooled engine and you want reliable heat living up north or flying at altitude. So how about liquid cooled engines? You might think there's just like a minor improvement to being able to have heat. Not so. If you think about cars that you've had up through the years, you notice that modern cars have heat much faster than older cars. And it's not just because of the thermostat that is now better. It's in fact the way that the coolant is routed through the engine in order to have instant or close to heat from the liquid cooled engine. Again, the exhaust system is the hottest part of the engine, but rather than running air across an external fragile exhaust system, liquid is routed through an internally cast manifold in the engine. And the liquid is then initially used for the heater. So you will have almost instant heat, reliable heat, heat that you can control with a small fan People say, well, you know, it's going to be a little bit more weight to have a small heat exchanger inside the firewall with a couple of pancake fans on them. It's not really true. By the time you trade pieces for 
uh, shrouds and mufflers and uh, exhaust pipes and ducting and louvers and things you have to open and close to regulate the amount of air to a very small heat exchanger with a switch that turns uh, a fan on that runs uh, air through the heat exchanger, the parts count and the weight is very similar. The advantage of course with the liquid cooling is that you can regulate it very closely and you have heat at any time and it's reliable heat that you will get from your system. How about this exhaust system? Let's just cover that since we just cover the heating. Um, like I was saying, exhaust systems on air-cooled engines are a contraption. They carry a lot of heat into the engine compartment. There are long pipes. Uh, everything is external to the engine. Liquid-cooled engines, the, particularly the ones that Viking worked with, with the Honda conversion engines, they have integral exhaust manifolds, where, whereas though just a muffler is bolted to the side of the engine and a tailpipe goes out through the cowling. Traditional engine, air-cooled engine, lots and lots of pipes and slip joints like we talked about to keep it from cracking, a lot of maintenance, a lot of exhaust gaskets going bad, uh, exhaust gas temperature probes in every uh, pipe leaving a cylinder, cylinder head temperatures, and it just goes on and on and on with complexity and maintenance and weight uh, and heat. So for simplicity, take a look at the Viking engine, look at the integral exhaust manifolds, and look at the nice single muffler that just exits the engine without a whole lot of bends and turns and slip joints and fancy welding. It's basically just a muffler and a tailpipe. Just a quick thing on horsepower. For instance, uh, the favorite engine now for from Zenith uh, is the 118 horsepower UL engine in the 750 and the 750 Cruiser. Be very careful when you look at these numbers uh, as far as what are the true numbers? What are, what are you actually getting at the propeller at the RPM that you're running? Um, if a demo airplane is cruising at, um, you know, like their favorite RPM of let's say 24, 2500 RPM, you're not getting any more than just, just a tad, tad over 100 horsepower if you look at their chart. And, um, then of course, if you pitch it for that, you will also not have a whole lot of uh, power for climb. Now, there's adequate power from the engine, uh, and uh, you will be able to fly two people. There's no issues with that, but just be careful when you look at performance numbers as far as uh, an unattainable RPM, for instance. Like, if, if the 118 horsepower engine is able to make 118 horsepower at 3,400 propeller RPM, you need to be realistic, look at some of the videos and see what those planes are actually cruising at and what they're actually taking off at, and you'll see that the engine is, you shouldn't even be talking about 118 horsepower, you should be talking about 110 horsepower engine or thereabouts. Let's talk a little bit about fuel. Air-cooled engines, liquid-cooled engines, the Viking engines, um, we all have kind of the same issues. Uh, we don't want to use uh, a lot of, we don't want any poor fuel in the engine. The air-cooled engines don't want to use any poor fuel. The main reason that uh, one particular engine was derated to 118 horsepower was because of fuel. Um, engine is not really happy running on 100 low lead. Uh, fuel available is not necessarily high test or high grade and uh, also high compression engines that go into uh, pop riveted aircraft will kind of shake the rivets so uh, you have to be careful about what engine you put into an airplane for instance uh, geared engines like the viking engines are very smooth running uh, direct drive engines are not so smooth running they have harsher pulses particularly with high compression and if you're putting it into a pop riveted airplane you might want to be careful uh, and at least inspect rivets on a more regular basis. The fuel has to be adequate for the engine. Now, of course, the Honda 130 engine, which is our most popular engine, is direct injected. Now, direct injection <clears throat> has more tolerance for fuel. Uh, 100 low lead fuel can be injected directly into the cylinder. The uh, low octane fuel can be injected directly into the cylinder, mid-grade, and 
there obviously are differences as far as the detonation threshold of these fuels, but being a direct injected engine, when you read up on that or watch YouTube videos about direct injection, you'll find that one of the big benefits of that engine is that octane levels can be lower, ignition timing can be advanced, and power output can be enhanced because of the fact that the engine is much more immune to detonation. <clears throat> and that's because the fuel is traditionally at high power, even in an injected or direct injected engine, injected during the intake stroke. So what happens is the fuel is atomizing in the cylinder during the intake stroke inside the cylinder rather than in the intake manifold. And because of that, the, there's a cooling effect taking place in the cylinder. This cooling effect helps with detonation and the engine can perform better with the direct injection than an engine that has port injection like modernized air-cooled engines that are available in the market today. There's always a question about, you know, Viking talking about direct injection and that being the most modern and the best system for high output aircraft engines. And then there's the question <clears throat> that comes up, which is, well, I thought direct injection also had drawbacks. And uh, not so really in an airplane engine, you know, in a car initially when direct injection was introduced into vehicles, there were uh, issues where because there's no fuel washing over the intake valve, <clears throat> the fuel is under high pressure going directly into the cylinder instead, bypassing the intake valve. There was issues where when blow-by gases from the crankcase of the engine was routed into the intake manifold for environmental protection standards, it cannot be let overboard like in an airplane engine, and that would coat the stem of the intake valve and could cause premature issues in the engine, such as lowering compression and so forth. Now, since this is not an issue in aircraft engines, and blow-by is always routed overboard or onto the externals of the exhaust manifold for burning, uh, in all airplane engines that I'm familiar with, like Cummings Continentals, Rogue Taxes, whatever, there's a blow-by tube off the crankcase, and none of it goes back into the intake manifold. And because there's no oil mist being routed back in, there's only clean air going through the intake manifold. And because of that, you get all the advantages of direct injection, which means cooling, internal cooling of the cylinder, pistons, more power due to advanced ignition, and a cleaner burning, easier starting engine that is overall more efficient and will have a longer life because it runs so clean and so efficiently. You know, uh, I was reading one question and it was kind of someone deciding between a few different engines and it came back all the time to like, yeah, I wish I, you know, I could get that auto converted engine because I love the Honda, I love this, I love that. And then every uh, paragraph there was a mention of uh, and it wasn't really just referred to as the Viking engine, it was also about the road tax or... And it was, uh, well, and then there's that pesky gearbox that I don't want. Well, that's, uh, that's something that might have to be reconsidered uh, by someone that's looking into an engine for their aircraft. Gearboxes have a lot of advantages on aircraft engines, okay? Um, if you're looking at, like, what is the drawback of a gearbox, uh, maybe you're thinking about, like, a rebuild or something, uh, that it's going to eventually wear out. Uh, and to me, that's just like, have you ever really looked inside of a, one of these gearboxes? It is, it's two or three gears and six or seven bearings and, and a couple of seals. It is the simplest thing in the world. Um, absolutely anyone in this, that has ever touched a set of wrenches can open up and rebuild a gearbox. So it's, it's not this all this end all thing. In fact, it is the perfect means to transmit power from uh, an engine to a propeller and having that isolated from the engine so that if there's ever any problem, it is just the gearbox that needs to be fixed and not the whole engine. Having a direct drive engine, so there's plenty of instances in VW conversions, uh, Corvair conversions, uh, uh, direct drive, any kind of direct drive engine where the expense was not a gearbox, um, the expense was a crankshaft or uh, the entire engine because of bearings being worn out, the whole block having to be line board and on and on and on. So having a gearbox that separates the engine and allowing the engine to do what it's supposed to do and the propeller to do what it's supposed to do is a great thing. Uh, can you even imagine like thinking about this 
uh, thought of like, well, I want a really simple engine. Just put the prop right on the crankshaft. Well, what have you done? Unless there's a tremendous amount of engineering behind that, you take a propeller and you put it onto something that looks like an uh, like a like a zigzag, an S turn, and it has pistons attached to it. And then you stick a propeller at it at, at the worst possible end of it, and then you want that to be reliable with unproven uh, setups, like you buying like experimental aircraft engines that now have the you all have a, a warp drive prop, a Zetsonich prop, a two blade prop, a three blade prop, a five blade prop, whatever, and this is directly onto the crankshaft of the of the engine. Okay, so you might want to like think about that that maybe that gearbox is not you know so bad. If I had a 2019 Honda Accord engine, it's a nice engine. I know it works in the car. Last thing I want to do is put a propeller at the end of it, okay? I want a gearbox in between. So if I ever did have a problem, I could work on the gearbox or the manufacturer could work on the gearbox and I would feel confident that my engine would still be okay. So that's uh, something to be considered when you're thinking about that pesky gearbox that might just not be that after. What else would that pesky gearbox do for you? Well, what it allow you to do is it allows you to, like we said, separate the engine from the propeller, which allows you to run any size propeller you want. Uh, Viking has traditionally run a 2.33 to 1 ratio. Uh, calculating that out, it it's just seems to be a very good ratio overall engine RPM to prop RPM. Once you get above like a 2.4 or if you get start getting into like a 2.5 or a 2.6, that's those are kind of crazy ratios where people are trying to get a lot of power from a small engine by running the engine extremely fast. <clears throat> so you want to stay away from ratios like that. If you look at someone with expertise like Rotax, they have gearboxes around 2.3, 2.4. Uh, Viking is 2.33, and that's about where you want to stay. Uh, the Big advantage then for a stall airplane, short takeoff and landing airplane, is that you will have lots and lots of torque at the propeller. If you look at a direct drive like Homing 320, and it has half of the thrust of a 1.5 liter Honda engine. So that gives you some perspective. Uh, as far as maximum thrust on a 130 engine, it's uh, close to 600 pounds, like 590 pounds. Maximum thrust on uh, Corvair is half of that. Uh, 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 UL engine is about half of that. So you're looking at like, if you want a stall airplane, you want a geared engine. That's just how it is. Uh, you want a Rogue Tax maybe, or a Viking 90 for your 701, and you want a 130 for, uh, or even a Rogue Tax if you're okay with a, with a little bit less power for your 750. Now a Cruiser maybe you can get away with a direct drive engine, but for any kind of stall installation, you want to use a geared engine to get that big prop, moving a lot of air, uh, otherwise you'll be waiting a long time before you're gonna get off the ground. Let's talk about something as important as uh, the fuel system for these engines that are used in home-built aircraft. The types of fuel systems, in fact, we have a whole article on our website <clears throat> about fuel systems you can read if you'd like. But the highlights of that is that uh, there's obviously still some carbureted engines out there, <clears throat> like the 912 Rotax, you can have that with a dual carburation. Um, you need to actually look into that and study that. There's always so much talk about that the Rotax 912 is so successful and so bulletproof and so tested, And <clears throat> but uh, with all that, you should consider and actually listen to people that own them uh, and you will see that there are uh, lots and lots of service bulletins. There's always upgrades to the engine. There are people that crash them because of something as simple as them using bicycle cables uh, for the throttle cables. In fact, the, the throttle is rigged so that it will pull shut and you have there's springs and there's uh, friction locks. And uh, <clears throat> of course there's dual carburetors that need to be tuned. And it's an engine that is one of the few that are certified and because of that that's why you see them in all these store-bought LSA airplanes. It's not because it's the ideal engine for a home builder that has to go through the process of mounting an engine, mounting an oil 
can to the firewall at the proper levels, mounting these bicycle cables for the throttles, uh, synchronized carburetors. Uh, it is an extremely complicated engine for what you get at the end. Uh, might be something to consider. Uh, and then, yeah, back to the fuel system now. Of course, now you will then have uh, gravity feed to uh, a, if it's a high wing, to a mechanical pump on the engine that feeds the engine uh, through the carburetors, which is the carbureted feed system. And it's the same with the O200. <clears throat> if you decided to use an O200 uh, or a Jabiru engine, they're carbureted. The history with the Jabiru engine is that um, uneven length runners and you will never have the fuel delivery to the cylinders the way you will have with an injected engine or even the Rotax with its dual synchronized carburetors would be better than <clears throat> the Jabiru with all the different length runners. Uh, there's all kinds of techniques uh, using aftermarket carburetors modify the runners, put um, 90 degree elbows in the intake, uh, divider plates, uh, all kinds of attempts to fix something that should have been fixed from, from the factory. Um, and then you have to, you know, with the carbureted systems uh, and uneven fuel going to the different cylinders, you get uneven wear in the engine because you have different power being produced by different cylinders. Your spark plugs will look different in every cylinder. You have to then monitor your exhaust gas temperatures and cylinder temperatures, and your mixture is now adjusted based on the on the hottest cylinder or the leanest running cylinder. So the whole system is uh, not desirable in today's world. Uh, a direct injected or a port fuel injected system is far better. So those are the the, the carbureted systems. Um, <clears throat> people might say, well, you know, it's, it's simple. It's always this thing about people that just throw, that are not mechanics, that throw this word out that, well, it's simple. <clears throat> well, it's not simple if it's mechanical and it sometimes doesn't work, you know. If, if it needs carburetor heat to fix the fact that it can ice up, then that's not simple. Um, if it needs all kinds of tweaking to make it run kind of good, uh, but not perfect, then that's not simple. If you need six EGT probes and six uh, cylinder head temperature probes or four for a four cylinder in every cylinder and then as a pilot manage this engine uh, with a mixture control uh, that's not simple you know so what you see as simple might not be simple now let's talk a little bit about fuel injection all right so the part of the injection system fuel injection system direct injection systems there's basically two there's port injection and direct injection uh, we might cover a little bit of that uh, later. Now, this was about fuel systems to feed the engine, and uh, it came about from a question about that an individual was looking at parameters on this engine and that engine that he might consider for his home-built experimental plane, and it came down to that, well, I want this engine, but I'd like to use the Viking fuel system, okay? So the person was, like, given... Uh, less credit to a Honda engine, but it was given uh, good credit to Viking for designing an uh, 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 aircraft fuel system for that engine. So that makes us proud, but at the same time, we wonder, like, uh, if, if another engine does not have a proper fuel system, or is not as safe, or has vapor lock, or can have fuel pumps overheat, or there's just not enough thought being put into the system, uh, as Viking has done to there in order to have the, you know, 100% complete firewall forward package that you need for the engine to be safe in your airplane. It's not enough just to have, you know, sell an engine and then throw a couple of uh, high pressure pumps in the box and, and ha tell you where to order your hoses and then off you go. Uh, the number of pitfalls involved with a system like that when it comes to vapor lock uh, pumps running too hot, the current draw of the pumps exceeding the uh, alternator or the generator on some of these engines, especially with both of the pumps running for takeoff and landing. So there's an awful lot of things that are not thought out properly because these, these people don't fly their own engines, you know. We find other auto conversion people, we find people that are in the know about uh, engines and selling new engines and other uh, air-cooled auto conversion engines and and um, very little flying on their own, so they don't have the expertise. So then the person says, well, 
I do like the Viking fuel system, so I'm going to buy that and, and realizing then that a fuel system with the small header tank that Viking uses that you can read up on with the in-tank pumps that are cooled by the fuel, uses very low amperage pumps, that has a return system that takes place inside the header tank uh, that doesn't have any high pressure lines running through the cockpit, uh, on the floorboards, everything is outside the cockpit and only gravity feed takes place anywhere around any people that are flying in this airplane. Um, so there's so many things that you know that you think, well, you know, I get that engine, seems good. I, f I think they've figured it out. Even even Rotax, you know, people have this assumption that Rotax, ah, oh, it's bulletproof. Everything's bulletproof. Well, it's bulletproof because professionals are installing their engines. Okay, <laughs> there's professionals that have developed an airplane, put a certified Rotax engine in there, uh, or non-certified have flown these and documented how to install it very, very carefully. Uh, and that's why they work. It doesn't mean that they're simple. It doesn't even mean that they don't have problems or quirks that could be uh, one step better. So now the, the header tank system that we sell that you will get uh, in a firewall forward package with the Viking is absolutely simple. It has all of the fuel components in one tank. It gives you two and a half gallons or that's our, our larger header tank, or it gives you just a little bit of fuel if you don't want the extra fuel. Here's where like one question comes in in relationship to like, well, a header tank might weigh something, but it's not true. You know, you get a two and a half gallon header tank. It has a fuel gauge in it, a center unit and a gauge on the panel. It gives you the exact 30 minutes, you know, at a medium power setting of, of safety, uh, reserve fuel. And you don't have to fly with five or six gallons in each tank, uh, which is an awful lot of weight if you do the math, just to feel somewhat safe that you have fuel on board the airplane. Because as you know, fuel tanks are long, they're, they have big flat areas, they can unport. So any prudent pilot that are flying, even on a little evening flight somewhere, um, or just going up for a little bit, will carry five, six gallons in each tank. Okay, so let's say it's just say it's five aside, it's 10. It's like 60, some, 60 to 70 pounds of fuel just because you don't trust your fuel measuring devices uh, that are in the, in the tanks or you worry about unporting. So with a properly sized header tank and a reliable direct acting float in the tank that tells you exactly the last two and a half gallons, even if you never get down to actually seeing that needle move, you know that it's there and you can run your, your main tanks down to a gallon side or two gallons a side. And then you have two, four, six, you have an hour's worth of fuel. So, you know, look really thoroughly, look into the fuel system, who has the best fuel system and say, well, you know, if somebody has thought that much through it and they have a fuel system that actually works with the engine, they are flying it themselves. They have it installed in pretty much every home built aircraft there is then those people, and in this case it ends up being us, have a real thought about you, okay? We have a thought that we want you to be safe, we want to fly every part of the system that we sell you ourselves, and we like to install it in as many home-built planes as we can. So the popular question about, can't you just sell me a gearbox? I mean, I can get my own engine. And uh, we can, good luck. Um, we do a lot more, and every engine manufacturer does a lot more than strap a gearbox or a propeller, for that sake, on the front of an engine and call it an airplane engine. You're forgetting that when you're buying that gearbox, you probably will add two or three years to your building time because we've already done that. We've tested the exhaust, we've dyno tested the engine, we've built the proper aviation grade wire loom for it. We have the proper uh, gearbox dampening system. We have all this stuff already figured out and tested. And we're not selling it for much more than the components. So for that question, don't just buy a gearbox, buy the whole thing tested. All right, so now I'm a big guy and I wanna take my girlfriend flying and, uh, or I'm, I gotta bring my, my dog and uh, some tents and some things like that. Uh, should I use the Viking or a direct drive engine or a Rotex or whatever? Well, you should use the Viking, in my opinion, because you should take a look at thrust testing, okay? 
nobody seems to actually want to do thrust testing. They poo-poo thrust testing. Like, um, oh, that's not accurate. The, the propeller makes a big difference. This makes a big difference. No, it doesn't. If a manufacturer, William Wynn actually with the Corvair did a lot of thrust testing on different engines and you can research that and look at YouTube um, uh, videos and so forth. And if you're looking for a plane and your question is, will it take off and climb good with me and what I want to carry in it, then thrust is what you're looking for. Uh, you're looking for two things, the thrust of the engine produced on a scale. It doesn't answer everything, but it answers if you're going to get off the ground. It, it shows you the performance of the propeller, the length of it that you can run with a geared engine. It shows you the um, amount of pitch that's running or the lack of pitch or whatever to get that amount of thrust. Okay, so thrust is a very important number if you're looking at for getting off out of a short grass strip or with a lot of people or when it gets hot out. You don't want an underpowered engine with a small direct drive propeller unless that is not a consideration. If, if you're going only on long distance cross country flights in a cruiser or a low wing airplane or something like that and you have asphalt runways, then this becomes less of a consideration.